Good everyone, and welcome to tonight's Common Council <laughs> meeting. Before we start our meeting, I would ask Madam City Clerk to read the quote for the week. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Notice how often you criticize and turn your criticism into tolerance and respect. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. I call the 21st regular meeting of the Common Council to order. Please call the roll. Boren. Here. Berg. Excuse. Serta. Here. Davis. Here. Groff. Here. Hannah. Here. Kittleson. Here. Clayunas. Here. Manny. Here. Meyer. Here. Montemayor. Here. Racky. Here. Ryan. Here. Susha. Here. Vanderweel. Here. And Verhasselt. Here. 15 present. Quorum is present. Alderman Davis, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Alderman Davis. Approval of the minutes, Vice President Serta. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that all the ROs be accepted and filed, all the RCs be accepted and adopted, and all the resolutions and general ordinances be put upon their passage. Pardon me? That's just to approve the minutes. Oh, make, an, make a motion to approve the minutes. <laughs> There's a motion to approve the minutes, and a second. Any discussion? There being none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Minutes stand approved. Resignations. Attorney McLean. Thank you, Your Honor. There's a letter dated January 23 to, uh, to the mayor from Marie Ellis advising that effective March 2nd, 2007, she'd be retiring from the position of city assessor for the city of Sheboygan. She says she'd like to take this opportunity to thank you along with the Common Council and all co-workers for your support during my term as city assessor for the city, signed by Marie Ellis. Before I ask for a motion to accept and file, I would like to thank Marie Ellis, who is in the, in the crowd tonight, for the exceptional work that she has done for the city of Sheboygan <coughs> in the past nine years. It's been quite a tenure, quite a memorable, very pleasant two years that I've been here. She has been nothing but gold. So, Marie Ellis, thank you very much for what you've done. <laughs> and we wish you wish you the best in the future and pleasant retirement. I'd ask for a motion to accept and file. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? There being none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Resignation accepted. And there's a letter from uh, Greg Wegeman, who's uh, on the Harbor Center Business Improvement District Board, advising that uh, he's resigning from the Business Improvement District. And there again, Mr. Wegeman has done has been a great board member. Uh, he's chosen not to continue his work. We thank him for the hard work that he's done, and wish him well in his future endeavors. I'd ask for a motion to accept and file. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Resignation accepted. And as far as appointments, a letter dated today's date, hereby submit the following appointment for your consideration. David Gass to be considered for appointment to the Business Improvement District to fill the unexpired term of Greg Wegeman, whose term expires 9-14-07, signed by the mayor. That will lie over. David Beeble to be considered for appointment to the Naming Rights Committee to fill the unexpired term of Thomas Holton, whose term expires 4-16-07, signed by the mayor. As you will recall, is the uh, Director of Public Works that chairs the, the uh, committee by, by resolution, so I would ask for a motion to confirm. Second. Motion and second to confirm. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Appointment confirmed. And John Vandemal to be considered for appointment to the Commission on Aging to fill the unexpired term of Andrew Geeson, whose term expires 430 07, signed by the mayor. 
And that I'd ask for a motion to confirm also. Motion and second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Resignation accepted. That's it. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Next, we have a we have a presentation to make. I would ask that Jim is it Siebert? Please step up. As I said earlier, the city is very blessed that we have a tremendous amount of, of very dedicated, hardworking employees. And here and there, an employee will go beyond their call of duty and do something a little extra. And not just do something a little extra, but do something a little extra that makes a big difference and a very positive impact on someone else's life. This is a case tonight, uh, and I'd like to present uh, this to uh, Jim Siebert, right? Yes. Okay. In recognition of recovering a purse which was stolen only minutes earlier from a woman in a robbery in the Kmart parking lot, because of your awareness and response, an, inex an expensive medical device and other important content were returned to the grateful owner. I commend you for your efforts and issue this certificate and affix my seal and signature upon it. James, we're very proud of you. Thank you. Your Honor, Common Council, I, uh, I'm actually kind of, of uh, flabbergasted by this, but I have to say, it's an old statement, there is no I in team. We have over 100 individuals in the Department of Public Works. There are another set of eyes on the city. We do a great deal of this, and, and we try to be careful with it, that we, we find wallets in parks, we find a variety of things, and luckily, most of it gets back to their owners. To the people that do these things, yeah, there are a lot of people watching. Sooner or later, we're going to catch you. And I greatly appreciate the help of Dave Beeble and uh, Rich Cruz, the fellow people at the Department of Public Works. They give us the flexibility. They give us the understanding and our judgment. They help us through the rough times, and we're able to try and do the best benefit we can to the citizens of the city of Sheboygan. I thank you very, very much, and I'm quite honored. Public forum, Madam City Clerk. Uh, yes, first on our list would be Joseph Heideman. Is Joseph here this evening? Oh, he's done here. Okay, next on the list would be Corey Bauk. <clears throat> and Corey, can you give me your home address, please? 329 St. Clair. The closer your mic is to you, the better. There How's you go. that? Forget. All right. And Corey, you will have five. I'm sorry, you will okay. have five minutes. Thanks. Good evening. My name is Corey Bauck, and I'm your neighbor at Fourth and St. Clair here in the city of Sheboygan. Like most of the city, I just uh, just paid my property taxes, so I'm happy to have a couple of minutes of your time tonight to share a couple of thoughts on that. I congratulate you for holding the line on taxes last year. That's good, but it's not great yet. It's not done. My neighbors and I believe that our taxes are still too high. The Common Council and its department heads have a long journey ahead. Uh, because there's still a lot of opportunity to continue to cut taxes and increase the level of services we uh, we're able to provide. Does the city want to provide great to our citizens? Sometimes I wonder, uh, specifically because of something I saw in the budget process last year. Uh, there was an evening when the Common Council was debating the budget and there were $600,000 worth of well-reasoned cuts before the, uh, before the board that night. They would have cut redundant programs, duplicate services, and underused equipment. $600,000 sounds like an awful lot of money, uh, but, but as part of a $30 million budget, operating budget, it's only 2% of what you spend. All the neighbors I talked with were very disappointed that the city couldn't find it within, its, within itself to make that 2% cut. Nobody likes budget reductions, but Sheboygan's families and Sheboygan's businesses deal with those small adjustments every single day, and they think the city should too. Uh, at least that's what the neighbors tell me. You know, I've really been impressed at how Sheboygan gets behind the United Way family of organizations uh, with its money. I know it's a charitable organization, it's not, it's not a city government, 
But uh, our, our Sheboygan neighbors open up their wallets voluntarily because the United Way delivers critical services efficiently. There's a lot of trust and respect that goes into uh, the community's willingness to fund United Way programs, a trust that they will deliver those needed services that are critical that the city needs, and a trust that they will deliver them with efficiency and with a thriftiness that, uh, that we could all learn from. Wouldn't it be great if Sheboygan's taxpayers believe that strongly in the efforts of the Common Council? What a way to earn respect and positive feedback and to be successful with our neighbors. And finally, I'm, I'm kind of concerned with where I see newcomers in our community moving to, uh, because I think it's a direct relationship to Sheboygan's value equation, that balance between the taxes we pay and the benefits and the lifestyle we're able to live as a result of that. And the company I work for has hired probably 20 managers in the past couple of years from outside central Wisconsin, and only two of them have chosen to live and relocate their families to the city of Sheboygan. Two. Why wouldn't they choose to live by the lake within walking distance of our terrific restaurants and, and nearby those great boutique shops on 8th Street? I hear it over and over again. The taxes are just too high there in Sheboygan. That's what they say. It's a shame for the town of Sheboygan and for Wilson and for Plymouth and for Falls to be gaining all those new taxpayers instead of our terrific city. So I believe that in order for Sheboygan to move from good to great, which is really what this body wants for our city, the Common Council and the City Department heads need to continue to work together with respect and a positive neighborly attitude on cutting taxes and delivering an increased level of services. My name is Corey Bow, and I'm one of your neighbors from District 2, and I thank you for listening. Thank you, Corey. Next would be John Berner. <laughs> John, can I have your home address, please? Sure, 1919 Broadway. And you will have five minutes, sir. Okay. Now, I haven't been up here lately, but I've been watching the council. Oh, I forgot. Good evening. It's been cold, little, little ice on the brain. Uh, and I've been watching the common council. And uh, I... With this John Doe hearing that when, uh, when it was over with and council people and the mayor had commented on it, and it kind of bothered me because he made it sound more like it was a trial and it was just a John Doe hearing. Nobody was really to blame. You talk about enemies. I see yourself as your worst enemies because it's your, yourselves that are making the comments and it's being <laughs> just exploited from there. On January 25th, the press put out an article <clears throat> and how the money was wasted on all these investigations, and the majority it was started right here in the Common Council. And it was good reporting for a change. I actually bought a press, and I tell you what, if the press, not just because of what they said, but of the truthfulness, there was no bias one way or the other. It was good reporting. And if the press would keep that up, I, w I would take it weekly. Another thing that bothered me on this uh, USS Eston is some common council members keep calling it a boat. There is a big difference between a boat and a ship. So if you don't know the difference on that, how can you comment on anything on it? And the view it's going to take away from the lake and when they tore down that green building there, and you drive by, what a terrific view, just seeing across the river again, seeing Blue Harbors, seeing South Pier. But that will end with the building of condominiums. I have no objection to that, but everybody, or not everybody, some people are saying this, this ship is going to take away and hide the lake. I don't know how it's going to hide. I don't know. A, a ship belongs on an ocean, a lake, not in a river. It's, from being in the service, I've been across the international dateline twice. 
by ship and twice by air. And the one time I went across on a ship, it was almost like World War II. We had about maybe four ships, and when morning came, there was a whole fleet of ships out there. There was something going on. We were heading towards Asia. It was a sight that only you see in the movies. Ships do have an important part. I thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> and lastly would be Larry McDonald. Five <laughs> Before I even got a chance to ask, thank you. And you will have five minutes, Mr. McDonald. Thank you. Did you know that the road to world peace starts in the heartland of America in our beloved city of Sheboygan, Wisconsin? No, but you will, and so will the rest of the world. We have a unique triangle at 3rd and Michigan, and you and I can make it world famous and draw tourists to our city. Please listen to my dream and let me know what you think. At, as you come up from the YMCA along Broughton Drive, you come into a, the point where you can go up 3rd Street or go down Broughton Drive, and I'm proposing a sign go there, and all, all the aldermen have a, a copy of my, my proposal. It says, the road to world peace starts here. And down below, the high road is up third, the low road is on uh, Long Broughton Drive, and the foam road is my coining a name for the road going toward the lake. And underneath that, where you have the control road, the alternate road, and the delete road, you've got control, alt, delete, which you computer fans know means let's stop here and start all over again. You follow the road up 3rd Street, one block to the corner where the Peace Pool is now. And I'm proposing a sign around the corner and a sign on the right. So says, start here, then follow our road map. Our road map is the golden rule. And on the back of that, I've got eight different religions. And the golden rule, in the, the way they state it, it, they all say the same thing, but in their own way. So worldwide, the golden rule is well known. And then next to that, a sign that says, may the harmony of Sheboygan's cordettes spread throughout the world. May the harmony of Sheboygan's cordettes spread throughout the world. And then uh, a, a little further down, another sign, may the Plymouth Foam Products plane crash find a purpose by waking our world up, UP capital with an asterisk, to the way waking the world up to the way to world peace. And on the back, I've got listed on the back of that, you've got the United Nations, we've got the United States, and now we've got the United People of the World with an asterisk. And another asterisk, our side is the human side. And then I've got my website down below, which gives you the background of my thinking. And then the last sign on the road, which I think could, could be a very probable sign for the city, a sign that just says, for local directions, make the phone this number. And that's a city number. And you don't have to build a building to have the, the visitors to Sheboygan drive in the parking lot and park and go in. And you, if, if you want to get directions for anything you want in the area of Sheboygan, you just got to call this phone number and ask them. And somebody can mend that phone number sitting at their desk. So that, I think the money you would spend on this, you could spend on developing my idea. And I thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Mr. McDonald. <coughs> That's it. Is that it? Yes. Thank you for addressing the Common Council tonight. The next item on the agenda is a tourism division update. Ms. Kim Swisher. Good evening, Your Honor, and members of the Council. In January 2006, Yolanda Graf and I began our work to promote the city of Sheboygan as a tourism destination. 
I would like to take this opportunity to outline our accomplishments throughout the past year so that you are aware of the work that the Tourism Division has focused on. Briefly, our accomplishments, we've created a database to store visitor requests for future use. We've assumed responsibility for answering the Chamber's former 800 number, as well as enacting our own toll-free number. We've created a new website, visitsheboygan.com. Working with Jacob and Clark, we created a marketing brand that includes Sheboygan's Shores. We created and implemented spring, summer, fall, and winter marketing campaigns. We created and implemented seasonal tourism publications. Our new winter spring tourism publication is included in your packet. We developed and now maintain relationships with county tourism partners. We are an active member of the newly formed TASC, Tourism Advisory Committee of Sheboygan County. We recognize the economic impact that we receive from our county tourism partners, such as Road America and Kohler Championships. I believe it's important to maintain good working relationships with our county partners as this allows us to better leverage our marketing dollars. We are currently working on a concentrated effort to partner with Kohler to fill our lodging for the 2007 U.S. Senior Open. We serve on the Kohler Traffic Committee. We participated in corp a Kohler corporate patrons event welcoming their business clients seeking to attend the U.S. Senior Open. We worked with Kohler to institute a lodging availability link on the Golf website to promote city and county lodging properties. We are partnering with Kohler Championships to host an information booth at Whistling Straits during the tournament this summer. We have developed community relationships and currently serve on the Chamber's Tourism Committee. We also work very closely with the Harbor Center Business Improvement District and are currently partnering with several Sheboygan businesses for our tourism packages. We assist community groups in promoting Sheboygan as a positive image and our tourism efforts and the potential to increase overnight stays. Last year, we assisted the Elks Club in preparations for their 2008 state conference that will be held in Sheboygan, and we assisted with the dedication of the Lao, Hmong, and American Veterans War Memorial dedication at Dillon Park. We have developed a strong partnership with Blue Harbor Resort and Conference Center. Our goal is to complement and support Blue Harbor's efforts in increasing leisure and business travel. We work with Blue Harbor in many ways to attract conferences to the city, and we have been involved in several meetings with businesses and business groups that have selected Sheboygan for their next event. We have received two Department of Tourism grants, totaling over $63,000. Our winter sales promotion and new event grants allow us to increase our visibility at key occupancy downtimes for our lodging properties. To better promote our Independence Day activities, we formed a July 4th Communications Committee. This informal committee meets monthly and is focused on promoting all of the activities in Sheboygan that we host over the holiday season. We created a listing of activities that was included in the Kohler Championship corporate binders that is distributed to their clients. Our 2006 marketing efforts generated a total of 32,175 contacts. Over 24,000 of, 24, of those contacts were visits to our new website. Over 4,500 of those contacts were visitors that we sent information to. As of September 30th, 2006, we saw an increase in 2006 room tax dollars of just over $24,000 compared to 2005. We're very proud of our community relation efforts. We recognize that our efforts not only make an impression outside of Sheboygan, but impact our community as well. If residents understand and support our efforts, this feeling will pass through to the visitors to our area. To keep open lines of communication and promote information, the Tourism Division sends emails on a regular basis updating local businesses and city employees on our activities. We also occasionally submit articles to the Sheboygan Press and I've been invited several times to speak on WHBL. Our 2007 goals include increasing the sale, sales of our winter tourism packages, hosting successful winter events, our Winter Arts Festival on February 16th and 17th, and our Sipping on Sheboygan Shores March 24th. These events create long-term benefits for our lodging, our restaurants, our retail and attraction businesses. We're implementing internet podcasting on our website, promoting various city amenities and assets, such as lodging, dining, and recreational activities. 
We're implementing internet webcams at the marina and at Blue Harbor to showcase Sheboygan's lakefront. We're developing fall tourism packages that will increase fourth quarter lodging occupancy. And we want to increase our marketing strategies to promote the Blue Harbor Conference Center. Business travel accounts for an estimated $1.18 billion annually, and we want Sheboygan and Blue Harbor to have a part of that pie. The actions that we've taken to get to this point and to reach our 2007 goals include laying the groundwork for our winter sales promotion. We are now in the midst of our new promotion, Shops, Sundries, and Style on Sheboygan Shores. The marketing campaign also encompasses the two new events, the Winter Arts Festival, February 16th and 17th, and Sipping on the Shores, March 24th, tickets for sale throughout business locations. The second grant that we received, Sipping on Sheboygan Shores, is a microbrew and wine tasting event. Both of these events focus on increasing log lodging occupancy, as well as increasing activity at our retail, restaurants, and attraction businesses. Both promotions target Appleton, Chicago, Madison, and Milwaukee, and are utilizing market, marketing components, including internet banner ads, print ads, direct mail, radio advertisements, and cable television ads. We incorporated two new components, tourism packages and visitor discount gift certificates. We are currently selling 43 different tourism packages on our website. As of last Wednesday, we've sold 14 packages, totaling more than $1,400 in gross revenue. Today, we surpassed $2,000 in gross revenue. While that may sound like a small number, this is a terrific start to a brand new endeavor. We've compiled 62 visitor discount gift certificates from our city businesses and created booklets that will be distributed throughout our 12 lodging properties to visiting guests. It is our goal to distribute these books at the U.S. Senior Open this summer as well. Our primary goal remains increasing the public's awareness of Sheboygan as a year-round tourism destination. We believe our efforts have been strategic and fruitful in our first year, and we are very optimistic for 2007. I welcome your questions. Please feel free to call me at the tourism office anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Thank sir. You. <clears throat> Thank you, Kim. Kim has done a remarkable job with our tourism division. Um, as you can see, she also uses alliterative titles, sipping on Sheboygan Shores. Everything has an S or a C or something like that. So, but she's very, very innovative. She's created a lot of energy uh, in, in that division. And, and Kim, we thank you very much uh, and keep up the good work. The next item on the agenda is mayor's comments. And I wanted just to share a few comments with you with respect to the motor vehicle fund that has become somewhat of an issue uh, in, in the paper and even at the, uh, <clears throat> at the uh, some of the forums that have been going on. Uh, I was talking to a gentleman uh, about three or four days and he said, keep up the good work. That's what I call long-range planning. He said, you have to remember that having that type of an account, $8 million, is like winning the lottery. Everybody wants to give you advice on how to spend it. Make sure you use it wisely. The motor vehicle fund is a fund that has been put together not just recently but a long time ago and it was done as a result of the city's inability to be able to fund uh, the, uh, the new uh, purchases of machinery for our public works department. And because of Tom Holton and Dave Beeble and uh, Mr. Wanderjim, Adrian, because of their, again, innovation and creativity, they were able to put together a process that would allow them to charge some of that money back for the use of the vehicles and put it back into, an, uh, into a fund that would then allow them in the future to buy some of this equipment when the time came. That caused some relief on our budget. It had caused some relief in our capital improvements plan where we no longer have to borrow $5 million a year. We borrow $3 million a year. So they're able to capitalize their purchases using this process. And it's been a very important process. I think every, every contractor, every, every smart uh, finance director would, would resort to something like this. It's important to know some of the uses that this motor vehicle uh, fund uh, provides for, and it's dump trucks, garbage packers, pickup trucks, street sweepers, bucket trucks, tractors, backhoes, graders, lawn mowers, snow blowers, leaf vacuums, tree branch grinders, 
and a lot more other specialty e equipment. There was a time, and, and we'll be, uh, Mr. Gephardt and I will be putting together a report from the Finance Committee to show you some of the history and the trends of this, of this particular fund. And you'll see at some point in 1988 where the fund had no money. In fact, at one point, the fund was in a deficit, and that caused some alarm. Uh, obviously, I wasn't here as, as a mayor, and I think all of you, well, I might say maybe Alvin McGrath was here, <clears throat> but a lot of you weren't here, and it's something that has been in place, but contrary to what some people may have extracted from that article, is nobody was stashing anything in the sense that they were hiding anything from you. Uh, this particular report, uh, fund shows up in the Finance Committee every time people were aware of it. You, all you had to do was ask a question about that. But again, I think it's a very important fund uh, to have, to continue to have. The question now is, does that fund have too much money? Uh, that's a question for the Council to, to, to answer and perhaps the Finance Committee to answer. Does it have too much money? Although if you look at the last four years, you'll see the, expenditure, the expenses and the revenues almost tapering off. So the bulk of the money hasn't been created in the last four years. And you'll be able to see that in one of those graphs that I like to put together, together for you. You'll see that within the last uh, four years, that money at two have been tapering expenses and revenue have been tapering off to a difference of about maybe forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 that goes back and then earns interest again. So the bulk of the money has been put aside through careful planning years back. And it's something that I think if we have a problem, folks, I like the $8 million problem that we have because it's money that's there. What we have to be careful is, is what I think the, the federal government and the state should have been careful with, with the uh, transportation funds. They call it a stash fund, went in there and dipped. The Social Security at the federal level became a, st uh, a little uh, a slush fund, I should say, and they went in there and dipped. You have to be careful that we don't react so quickly to something like this and that we think things through and plan it as the other aldermen have and the former mayors have plan this through so that at this point we're able to say we're sitting pretty good because if all our equipment, God forbid, all our equipment were to break, the citizens would not be shortchanged of any service themselves. And that's because of what you have done. So when somebody doubts you, don't accept that doubt because what you've done is a remarkable job and I thank you for that. There was also a statement made that perhaps we should borrow against, uh, against that and and fund part of our police station. That, that is a possibility that the council could look. Although if you look at the interest rate for a 12-year bond, the interest rate sits at four and a quarter. We earn five and a quarter interest on that account. Why would you want to borrow when you're earning more on it? It's something, for, again, for the council to, to weigh, something for the, the finance committee to weigh. You've got something good here that came out of careful planning that's an example and a role model for other processes that we can put in place to continue to plan for bad days. So I, I caution you to, to re, overreact to, to publicity. It's, it's something good that's here. It's something good that you've done. And let's look forward to working together and making something productive out of it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda is a notice of a public hearing on the vacation and discontinuance of the unpaved north-south alley between North 7th Street and North 8th Street between Bell Avenue and Gilly Avenue. <clears throat> and that's just a notice. We need to have the, any interested parties. Okay, is there any interested party that would like to address the council on that particular issue? Is there any interested party that would like to address the council? Is there any interested party that would like to address the council? There being none, Alderman Serta. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that the floor be closed. Second. Motion to close the hearing. Second. Any discussion on that? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next, we have two hearings. Um, the first one to change the zoning of property located at the terminus of North Taylor Drive from SR5 Suburban Residential 5 to class MR8 mixed residential 8 classification, and two, to amend the text of the historic preservation regulations of the City of Sheboygan zoning code relating to the rights of property owners relating to the designation of historic structures, sites, and districts. Is there anyone here that would like to address the council on those issues? We will take um, Mr. Lewandowski and, you, and then you, sir. 
Please step up to the podium. Sorry, what? Okay. <clears throat> okay, just let us know which one you're going to be speaking uh, about. And the historic preservation. Preservation, thank you very much. Please continue. I'm here tonight to speak about the historic preservation ordinance changes that you would like to make tonight or have under consideration. Since the last meeting, I was sent some information by the Wisconsin State Historical Society. It's 25 pages long. I'm not going to read all of it. But basically, it says that the State Historical Society is against any requirements where people, owners, have to do any written consent. One way that this would affect is people who own historic homes have an opportunity to get 25% of the money that they spend back in tax credits. The State Historical Society has said that if a city or community has restrictions that homeowners need written uh, permission to do this from the city, that those homes are no longer eligible to get the 25% tax breaks, and that would apply to anybody that lives in that community. Also, some of the articles that I was sent, it starts out with court cases that rule against written permission from owners. And the first one that they mention here is a U.S. Supreme Court case decision in Penn Central Transportation Company versus the City of New York, which establishes that historic preservation ordinances without owner consent provisions are con constitutionally valid. And then they go on. In such cases, property owners are allowed to opt out of historic preservation laws without regard for the social and economic benefits of preserving historic resources. The end result is that fewer historic properties are protected. Despite the proliferation of so-called owner consent provisions, little thought has been given to their vitality. Legislatures include owner consent requirements in historic preservation ordinances as a means to placate men very property owners. Preservationists go along for fear that otherwise no historic preservation ordinance will be passed. And I know our committee has felt that way. But are they legal? Owner consent provisions raise several sections, serious questions. Do they in fact violate the due process clause of the 5th and 14th amendments to the United States Constitution as an unlawful delegation of authority to private individuals? Do they undermine the police power objective of preserving historic property for the general welfare? Are they consistent with state enabling authority? Just going over a few points that I highlighted here. It says decisions to include property on a local, state, or national register should be made exclusively by objective professional determinators of historic or architectural significance. It is through this process that a fair and comprehensive list of properties is identified for protection. The listing of historic resources provides an invaluable planning tool and helps to ensure that significant resources are identified, researched, and recorded. Another part says, as with consent provisions and other types of land use ordinances, these provisions undermine the public pur purpose of preserving historic structures by allowing individual property owners to decide what shall be protected based on subjective rather than objective factors. Several important principles can be extracted from the various court decisions in here. It says owner consent provisions are more likely to be struck down when they delegate authority to individual property owners to decide how the general welfare shall be served. 
application of these principles of owner consent provisions in historic preservation ordinances suggests that many courts would find such provisions unlawful if challenged in court. Because property is not subject to regulatory controls under historic preservation ordinances, unless formally designated as historic owner consent provisions, serve to undermine the police power objective of preserving historic structures of historic resources. Moreover, such decisions are made by purely subjective motives rather than on the basis of subjective criteria, either in the context of individual landmark designations or historic district designations. The ability of a few individuals to decide the application of an ordinance enacted to protect the welfare runs afoul of the due process clause of the U.S. Constitution. It says, owner consent provisions that confer legislation authority on property owners have been consistently struck down by receiving courts as unconstitutional. And as I said, many of these cases are cited in here. And I will give City Clerk Richards a copy of this so she can give it to all the aldermen. But I would like to ask, in addition, that you hold off this vote until you can look at all this. It also says here, many of the concerns identified by the Supreme Court in its trilogy of owner consent cases and a number of state courts as well are present in historic preservation ordinances with owner consent provisions. It also adds additional concerns are also present. Once a property owner decides to withhold his or her consent, historic property cannot be regulated. And it gives cases where this was struck down. It says other due process and equal protection concerns. Under the Due Process Clause of the U.S. Constitution, land use laws must be derived from the police power. The police power is, an, is the inherent authority in each state to regulate, protect, or promote the public health, safety, morals, or the general welfare. And to preserve historic buildings falls in this category. It says near, near the end here, Indeed, under the Supreme Court's ruling in Keystone Coal Association v. De Benedictus, one could argue that the historic preservation ordinances with owner consent provisions should be invalidated under the 5th and 14th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution as a private benefit as opposed to a public purpose statute. And I'll give all of these to... City Clerk Sue Richards, but I would ask that you would either vote against these written consent by the owners or at least hold it off until the next meeting after you've had a chance to look at all of these articles. Thank you. Thanks. Please state your name and which hearing you're talking uh, on. My name is Craig Gottsecker, and I'm here uh, seeking your approval for the zoning change at the northern end of Taylor Drive in Sheboygan. <clears throat> the property consists of approximately 3.3 acres of land. It's presently zoned as an R5, which allows for a uh, density of five units per acre, uh, meaning that presently we could build up to 18 homes on that site. I am looking for an R MR8 zoning uh, to make way for a condominium development, which would contain um, five two-family condominiums uh, equaling 10 units, where the zoning uh, or the, the density would equate to three units per acre. Uh, the homes will be much more uh, compatible. The condominiums will be much more compatible with the homes in the neighborhood. Uh, each side would uh, uh, comprise of about 1,700 square feet per unit. 
Um, the, the site also has uh, a substantial amount of frontage uh, on the Maywood, on the southern border of the Maywood property. Um, it, it's a, I think it's a, a very nice development. We've got uh, the plans designed, and um, we're just looking for your approval. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like? Yes, sir. Will you step forward? And again, your name and if you have an address and which hearing you're talking about. My name is John Sweeten. I'm the property owner on the north end of Taylor Drive next to the property that uh, Greg is looking to develop. I guess I would ask that uh, you would hold off on that vote. Um, I really know nothing about his development, and I guess I would like some more information uh, to see what he's planning on doing there. Um, I guess I have just a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if this is the place to ask them or not but I just hold off on that vote, um, and hopefully we can discuss it and get some answers. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to? This is just strictly for addressing the council. No, no, no responses. There's a couple of that. Greg has his hand up again, and then this gentleman okay. in front. Mr. Well, we've got this gentleman here next. We're not uh, going to engage in debate. This is strictly to address the council about your concerns regarding any of these two hearings. My name is Stuart Lutsky. I live at uh, 2818 North Taylor Drive. Mr. Um, Lutsky, could you spell your last name, please? L-U-T-Z-K-E. Okay, and I'm talking thank about the, the construction of the homes on the end of Taylor Drive. I'd like to have you hold off until we see the plans and see what's going to be built there and, no, so we have an understanding too. You know, that's that's the biggest thing. So we know what's going on. That you know, how he's going to build it, how it's going to affect the, our area, basically. So we just know that. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Just for the council's uh, knowledge, the there were letters sent out by the uh, the um, city development office to all neighboring. Is that correct, Mr. Sokolowski? Actually, it's, hmm? I do. I sent them out. Oh, you did? Yes. So, yes, that's correct. Okay. Anybody else who would like to address the council? Vice President Serta. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that the hearings be closed. Okay. Motion second to close hearings. Any discussion on that? <clears throat> there being none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. <clears throat> Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And thank the, uh, the public for addressing the council. Next item on the agenda is a consent agenda, items 21 1 to 2136. Vice President Serra. Thank you, Your Honor. Now I'll make a motion that to accept and file all the ROs and to accept and adopt all the RCs and that all resolutions and general ordinances be put upon their passage. Second. Motion and second. Under discussion, we have Alderman Graff. Thank you, Your Honor. Item 2124, which is an RC by uh, Special Committee on Risk Management. Uh, due to some recent additional information that we received this past week, I'd like to um, refer that back to um, risk management. Okay, that'll be done. For 2124 will be referred back to risk management. Please make that notation. Alderman Manny. Thank you, Ron. Uh, document 21-4. I'd like to call our attention to it, and if I may, make a few comments. Please do. Uh, document 21-4 notes the governor's response to our council's recent overture to the governor and the state legislature. While appreciative of our support for bringing a comprehensive health care plan out of committee and to the legislature for deliberation, the governor's letter does not indicate his strong support of that effort. Probably for political reasons, He's focusing his energies on increasing the number of people covered under the Badger Care Plus program. While his effort in that direction has much to commend it, it does not deal with a fundamental issue behind the health care crisis, which is the cost of care. Thus, I take this opportunity to ask all of us, citizens of Sheboygan, to call our representatives in the legislature, Senator Lipum, 
and Representative Van Ackeren and tell them that we strongly support a comprehensive health care plan for the state of Wisconsin, one which will cover the vast majority of our citizens, one which will eliminate the inequities inherent in our current delivery system, and one which will use market mechanisms to spur competition unless countless ordinary citizens like you and I so approach our legislators all across the state, such legislation is going to have no prospect of success. Thank you. Well spoken, Alderman Manny. Thank you very much, sir. On the consent agenda, 21-1 through 21-36, except 21-24, which will be referred back to risk management. Please call the roll. Serta. Davis, Aye. Graf, Aye. Hannah, Aye. Kittleson, Cleonis, Manny, Aye. Meyer, Aye. Montemayor, Racky, Ryan, Susha, Aye. Vanderweel, Aye. Verhasselt, Aye. and Boren. 15 ayes. Motion carries. Communications and petitions 2137 through 2142 to be referred. Report of officers 2143. Uh, where the city clerk submitted a communication from Indian Trails Incorporated stating that effective February 1st, 07, they, they will be providing bus service to this community, replacing the Greyhound line service. <coughs> Vice President Serta. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that the RO be accepted in file. Motion and second to accept in file 2143 under discussion. Alderman Boren. <coughs> uh, thank you, Your Honor. I have a couple questions. Uh, First of all, where is the Indian Trails going to be stopping in Sheboygan, and uh, what times are they going to be stopping? Once a day, twice a day? I was wondering if anybody had that information. Alderman uh, Bourne, I don't, and Mr. McDonald is not here. I will ask my assistant to make notation of that. We will get the answer to it tomorrow. Would that be okay, sir? Thank you. It was mainly also for the general public to know, of okay. course. Okay. Uh, Attorney McLean, maybe? Thank you. Uh, Ron did mention at the staff mayor's meeting this morning that it stops at the bus transfer point currently downtown and uh, comes through at 7.15 in the morning. He mentioned that because they've got a little, that, that's when the buses also come in here, so it's kind of uh, jammed up, but they're, they're working on that. But uh, I think, I believe it comes through the other direction once later on in the day, but I don't know when. I know that, uh, Mr. McDonald, we will be putting out a notice to the public in the paper, too, and perhaps even the radio. So we should take care of that. Thank you for your concern there, Alderman Boren. Anything else? There will be a none. All those in favor of accepting and filing 2143, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 2144 by the city clerk submitting a communication from the Blue Harbor Condo Association stating their concerns regarding the fact that the city is considering allowing the development of a Grand Stay Hotel in the South Pier District. Vice President Serta. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that the RO be accepted and placed on file. Second. Motion to second to accept and file. Under discussion. There being none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 2145 through 2147, to, uh, excuse me, 2145 and 2146 lies over. 2147 by the purchasing agent submitted an evaluation request for the for the proposal of providing software consulting services, I'm sorry, for the for proposal for providing software consulting services. Alderman Graf. Did you want to? Your Honor, I thought we were holding that for item 21. Um, Fine. 74. Okay. That will be held for, as Alderman Graf stated, for 2167, is that correct? 70, 74, 70. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. You said 74, and I think it's right, 60, 67. 2167. Okay, everybody got that? 2147 will be held to act on with, along with 2167. Thank you. 2148 through 2164 to be referred. Alderman Vanderweel. Thank you, Honor. I would like to speak on uh, 2153. I would like to uh, make a motion to file that document. Motion and second to file 2153. Please continue. Uh, under discussion, I'd just uh, like to say that this is, we all had a chance to look at it. Uh, I think we all had a chance to read it. And it's just basically an angry constituent upset with an elected official. So I think it would be proper to file it. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Second. 
There's a motion and a second under discussion. There being none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Resolutions 3, 2165 by Alderman Groff, authorizing the Mayor's International Committee to apply for and obtain a temporary restaurant permit for the committee-sponsored Taste of Sheboygan County event in March 2007. Alderman Groff. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd move that that resolution be put upon its passage. Second. Motion and second to put it upon its passage. Under discussion. There will be a none. Please call the roll. Davis. Aye. Graff. Aye. Hannah. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. Cleonis. Aye. Manny. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Radke. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Susha. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Verhasselt. Aye. Warren. Aye. And Serta. Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carries. 2166 by Alderman Meyer, authorizing entering into a monitored and well license agreement. Alderman Meyer. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. Motion and second to put 2166 upon its passage. Under discussion. Under discussion. Um, I would like Attorney McLean to explain this to the council and the public. Thank you, Alderman Meyer. Attorney McLean. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. This is uh, one of those items that you find out when you're looking to buy property or sell property and you do a survey, you find that uh, the site that we're looking to purchase from the county on North 23rd Street has uh, several existing monitoring wells. If you look at your packet, the next to the last page has a, uh, a survey showing three monitoring wells, that uh, two of which are on the south property line of the property and one is in a little ways. Uh, what, the, what this proposed agreement does is uh, this would be entered into when we close on the purchase of the 23rd Street site. We would grant a license to the county to maintain those monitoring wells uh, potentially under this agreement till the end of calendar year 2007. Uh, there is a provision that's important to the city on the second page, it's uh, under the term, the, the section uh, uh, four term uh, for uh, 4C, early termination, indicates that this agreement shall terminate as provided in section 4A or earlier upon default by licensee of any requirements of this license or upon a reasonable determination by licensor, which is the city, that this license will materially impede license source construction on the premises in 2007 or upon the DNR no longer requiring the monitoring wells and cleanouts. Uh, so what that says is uh, if there's going to be, if they're still in place, uh, when we engage in initial construction of the police station site and to the extent that any of those wells would impact the construction that this would, agreement would terminate, the county would remove those monitoring wells. Uh, currently, the county's uh, consulting engineers, environmental consultants, believe that these, uh, the, uh, this monitoring uh, is due to be closed out and to get their closure letter from the DNR by a, uh, at least September. Uh, and as I see it, really should not impact our construction on the, on the 23rd Street site. Again, to the extent we do start construction before they are closed out, uh, this agreement uh, terminates and we'd have to deal with moving those monitoring wells. Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, just to make it clear, these monitoring wells are nothing more than a PVC pipe which is in the ground approximately six inches around and to, to vacate the wells, they simply pull the pipe, fill up the hole with clay slurry, and it's gone. So it's not a, uh, not a, not a major undertaking. Correct, Elmer Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we will call the roll. Graf. Aye. Hannah. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. Clionis. Aye. Manny. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Radke. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Susha. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Verhasselt. Aye. Warren. Aye. Serta. Aye. And Davis. Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carries. Bear with me. This comes up at the very end of the agenda. 
Okay, 2167, now we will act along with 2147. Alderman Groff. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I would ask for a suspension of the rules, please. There's a motion second to suspend. Is there any objection? There being none, please proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I would move that the resolution be put upon its passage and the RO be accepted and placed on file. Second. Motion and second, under discussion. Under discussion, um, due to the fact that I believe it's the, um, the Salary and Grievances Committee would like to discuss um, plans uh, regarding the Human Services Department and so forth, uh, the software that's coming with this, and they'd like to discuss it with them as soon as possible. They'd like to enter into this contract as quickly as possible. This has already been discussed at the Finance Committee, so it's just lying over here, and that's the reason for suspension and passage tonight. Thank you, Alderman Groff. Any other discussion? There being none, please call the roll. Hannah. Aye. Kittleson. Clayunas. Aye. Aye. Manny. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Radke. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Susha. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Verhasselt. Aye. Boren. Aye. Serta. Aye. Davis. Aye. And Graff. Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carries. 2168 and 69 lies over. 2170 through 2173 to be referred. Report of Committee 6, 2174. By building use, recommending referral of documents submitting a communication from Mike Williams stating why he believes the decisions made by the council regarding moving the police mechanics to the, police, to the Department of Public Works instead of keeping them with the new police station was premature and inept and without looking at the future costs associated making this move. Uh, is there a motion here? Or Alderman with my oath? Thank you, Your Honor. I move to file. Second. Motion and second to file under discussion. Um, we've discussed this and decided this in council before. I can't imagine that we need any further discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? There being none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Report of committee 8 2175 by finance recommending authorizing a transfer of appropriations in the 2007 budget. Alderman McGraw. Thank you, Your Honor. I would move that the, um, the RC be accepted and adopted and the resolution be put upon its passage. Motion and second to put 2175 upon its passage under discussion. Alderman Bourne. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'm not going to support this tonight. Uh, I was not at the Finance Committee meeting when this was discussed. I was on vacation, but I have been attending the subcommittee meetings on shared services, almost all of them. And the subcommittee on shared services, along with the shared services committee, has had presentations uh, regarding staffing of dispatch from Rock County, which includes Janesville, which is a county uh, about 30,000 people larger than Sheboygan County, about 155,000 people. They, I believe they've also had presentations from Fond du Lac and uh, Manitowoc counties on their dispatch. And th their table of organizations, and all of these counties are running successful dis dispatch centers Either run, by the, either run by the Sheriff's Department or an independent department like in Rock County in the Janesville area. And their table of organizations, I believe, are readily available to the, both the uh, Shared Services Committee and the subcommittee. And I believe that this study is really not necessary because of the fact of the input from the successful counties that are doing uh, single dispatch for 9-11. And... I really don't think it's rocket science. I think with the people that are on the committee, both the uh, county board supervisors, the aldermen, the public members, and the professionals from the sheriff's department, the police department, and the various law enforcement entities and the fire departments from around, the, uh, around Sheboygan County, that this committee, along with the input they've already gotten and the table of organizations from these various uh, counties, should be able to make a decision. I realize that uh, $3,750 in the scheme of things is not a large amount of money, and the county is also going to be paying half of this, but I just believe that this survey is going to do nothing but delay the further discussions of this committee, and I just don't think it's necessary, so I'm not going to support spending the $3,750. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Bourne. Alderman Susha. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, 
Alderman Bourne spoke very eloquently on this, this subject, and I am on the Shared Service Committee representing the city, and I'm also on the subcommittee. Um, and during both of those discussions when we talked about this issue, I voted no uh, to support this, and I'm going to vote no again tonight for that reason. But just to give you a little bit of background as far as where we are with the situation, the Shared Services Committee basically gave the green light to go ahead and move forward with uh, combining dispatch between the city and the county. So the subcommittee was formed to look at this uh, further in depth. And overall, the chairman of the committee is doing an excellent job. He has it very uh, well outlined as far as what we need to accomplish. And there's a lot of agreement so far on most issues with the exception of the number of supervisors needed uh, to oversee uh, the, the staffing. Uh, there's agreement that we need a total of 24 uh, dispatchers that would be hired. And then the question is how many supervisors. Some information we originally were given relating to APCO, which is the company they're looking at bringing in to consult, was that uh, they would recommend nine supervisors. So what that would mean is that during any shift, during any day, you would have two supervisors not answering the phone, and those two supervisors would be watching the five dispatchers that are working and just supervising them. And um, I don't think we need to pay $7,000 if we already know what they're going to say. And I agree with what Alderman Bourne said, that um, there are so many successfully running dispatch centers across uh, the state that we could just look at their tables of organizations and move forward. Ultimately, it probably doesn't matter what the Shared Service Committee decides as far as staffing because the end result would be what the County Board Supervisors decide that they can afford in the long run. So with all of that said, I, I am going to vote no against this, but I will tell you that right now it looks very positive and I'm very optimistic that we will be combining uh, dispatch centers with the county in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Susha. Alderman Vanderwiel. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. I'm on that committee also with Alderman Susha and, and Alderman uh, Graf. And I agree with Alderman Bourne that, that I, I don't think this study is necessary. 3750 for the study, a dollar would be too much for the study. It's just we have the information available to us. The sheriff and the police department, they give us their opinion, and I respect their opinion on how, how we need to staff it. And as Alderman Susha said, that when it comes down to it, it's up to the county or the city on, on how we're going to staff it. But we are still looking at the feasibility of it, and I think when it comes down to it, it's going to cost too much. The subcommittee is to look at the feasibility of it, and I guess I don't agree that it's, it's almost a done thing. I, I question that. And as far as I'm concerned, this is premature because we're not even sure if we're doing it, and to spend money on the study might not even happen. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Vanderweel. Alderman Graf. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> As it was mentioned, I'm also on the, this committee. And part of the reason this study is, has been requested is because there has been a discussion as to how many supervisory personnel is needed. And the, the members of the um, Shared Services Committee that did support this and, and voted this um, to be done uh, are hoping that this group um, will be bringing us an estimate of, of what a joint or a combined dispatch center would need as far as supervision. And that's the reason this is being done. And just so that everybody's clear, it's not 3750 for this study, it's 7000 This This 3750 represents one half of the cost of the study, which will be paid for by um, one half by the county and one half by the, um, the city of Sheboygan. And that's the reason this was brought forward, um, because uh, there is that discussion going on, and the majority of the committee did say that they wanted this study done so that we'd get some expert opinion as to how much supervision was needed. So Thank I will you. be supporting this. And I'm, I'm going to call on the next alderman. I just wanted to say that, <clears throat> once again, Alderman Bourne's um, great business background kicks in. I, I um, originally felt that uh, perhaps the, the, the expenditure should be uh, incurred to, to solicit some expert, quote-unquote, uh, opinion on how many people it takes to man. But quite frankly, as uh, Alderman Bora stated, we can figure that out ourselves. We don't need to spend $3,700. It's, to me, it's, it's, it's nonsense at this point. Alderman Kittleson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to say I, too, have been attending the city-county shared services meetings, and I think this is way too important. I, I think we should support the study. Um, I think it's very important that we have an outside, uh, an outside group take a look at this and uh, give us just an unbiased opinion on what we need here. Um, and that's why I will support this, absolutely. 
Thank you. you. Alderman Ryan, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I also support doing this study. Um, if this is a totally unbiased consulting <laughs> firm that will give us their opinion, I believe that's what we need. From what I'm hearing here tonight, uh, we're not talking about sharing services on dispatch. We're talking about the county making the decisions on dispatch. Um, it's up to the county board to decide the number of supervisors that they can afford. Uh, this is not shared services. This is giving dispatch to the county. Uh, I do believe that we need the opinion of a totally unbiased organization to give us direction. Thank you. Okay, we will. Oh, Alderman Serna. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, do we know at what point um, the county is taking action on approving their the funding for the study as well? Have they decided on this? The county, I believe, will be acting on it uh, very shortly. The the council sort of got a little ahead, and uh, uh, the finance committee, I should say, and approved it. And it's, it's, there's a story behind that I'd rather not share here tonight. Uh, but the county, I was at the last shared services committee meeting, and quite frankly, a little surprised that the city had already approved it because it was supposed to go back to the main committee and then back to the city and back to the county. Well, one step's already been taken care of. Uh, but to answer your question, it should be coming around probably at the next uh, county supervisor meeting, I believe. Thank you. Okay. We will call the roll on 2175 where they're to authorize 3700 something dollars to hire an expert. Please call the roll. Kittleson? Aye. Clayunas? Aye. Manny? No. Meyer? No. Montemayor? No. Radke? No. Ryan? Aye. Susha? No. Vanderweel? No. Verhasselt? No. Boren? No. Serta? No. Davis? No. Graf? And Hannah. Aye. Five eyes, ten no's. Motion fails. Ordinance is introduced 10, 2176, and 2177 lies over. 2178 through 2184 to be referred. 21 uh, through 2184 to be referred. Matters laid over. 1820 and RO. Number 411-0607 by the City Plan Commission recommending vacating a portion of the north-south unpaved alley located between North 7th Street and North 8th Street and between Bell Avenue and Gilly Avenue. Alderman Montemayor, we would just take that one only. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that the RO be accepted and the ordinance be put upon its passage. Motion and second to accept and file and put the ordinance upon its passage. Any discussion? There being none, please call the roll. Manny. Abstain. Meyer. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Radke. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Susha. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Verhasselt. Aye. Boren. Aye. Berg. I'm sorry. Serta. Aye. Davis. Aye. Graf. Aye. Hannah. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. And Clyunas. 14 eyes, one abstention. Motion carries 2126 and RO 4410607 by the City Plan Commission recommending rezoning property located at the terminus of North Taylor Drive from Class SR Suburban Residential 5 to Class MR8 Mixed Residential 8 classification. I would ask, uh, after hearing the concerned citizens, that perhaps they do not have enough information uh, to ask someone, uh, some alderman, to please refer it back to the City Planning Commission. Would anybody like to do that? Second. Motion and second referred back, uh, back to the City Plan Commission, at which point I would invite you to uh, attend to express your concerns. Gentlemen, thank you. Any discussion on referring it back? There being, there being, there being none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. 2027, an RO number 442-0607 by the City Plan Commission recommending repealing and recreating subsections of the historic preservation regulations of the zoning code relating to the rights of property owners relating to the designation of historic structures, sites, and districts and passing the attached ordinance. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to also take the next document, 2064, with it. Okay. And I'd like to make a motion to accept and file the ROs 
put the resolution and substitute resolution upon their passage. Ordinance. It's an ordinance. Ordinance. Sorry. Substitute ordinance. Put the substitute ordinance upon its passage. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. Under discussion. Um, thank you. Right now, the two documents are not identical, so I'd like to make an amendment so they both would be identical. Um, if you take document 2027 and you turn to the second last page, right above section 3, the last sentence reads, however, the designation of a historic district shall not be effective unless the owners of record of 75% of the affected parcels expressly agree to the creation of the district in writing. So what they're basically saying is if you want to form a district, 75% of the homeowners within that district would have to agree. If you go to the other document, um, that document went to the Historic uh, Preservation Committee and they changed it to 50%, a simple majority. And my amendment is to make them both identical. Let's meet in the middle. I would amend it so two-thirds of the affected parcels would have to agree. So the motion would be to put it to two-thirds. There's a, a motion to amend. Is there a second to that motion? Second. second. Under discussion. Thank you. Um, just to, to give you a little more background in regards to why this is coming about, I know that we heard a speaker earlier talk about how um, you lose some impact of the Historic Preservation Committee if the homeowners have the option to say no. As of right now, if the city decides to create a historic district, it doesn't matter what the homeowners say. It's up to the council. The council will say this is going to be a district. Everybody in that district has no right other than they have to obey the rules then outlined by the Historic Preservation uh, Committee. And let me just give you a simple example. I've gone through some of the information provided by the state and if you, want, if you have a brick home that's in a district and you want to do some tuck pointing because you have a lot of missing mortar in between your bricks and you're getting a lot of drafts coming through the bricks and things like that, you get an estimate for $20,000. Someone's going to come over to your house, grind out the mortar between every brick and put a new, mor new mortar. Well, that's fine if you're not in a district. If you're in a historic district, now new rules come into effect. In the new rules, it says that you have to hire a contractor that's going to hand chisel out all of that mortar. So if your initial estimate was $20,000 to have a mason come in with a grinder to remove all that mortar, well now you have to go back and say, now how much would it cost if you have to chisel it out by hand? So I don't think that the expense that some of these historic renovation projects would incur, it's not worth the 25% tax credit. Because now if you're hand chiseling, your estimate's probably going to be about $100,000. So you're actually costing, you're, you're costing the, too much money to be expended by the homeowner. So that's why um, there's a change to the historic district. And then also, oh, I suppose we're just speaking on the amendment right now, but that's why it's important to have the homeowner be able to say, yes, I want to be part of this district. I want the 25% uh, tax credit, but they need the right to say no, because that is a huge financial burden that we'd be pushing on people within a historic district, and they would have no say that it's coming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think there's some confusion between historic districts and historic properties. I don't believe being in a historic district would automatically, uh, you would automatic, automatically have to abide by the rules of a historic property. There is a difference, I, I guarantee you. They're, they're, historic districts have buildings in them which have no historical significance whatsoever. Um, I'm, I'm the sole alderman on the, on the Historic Preservation Committee. And if we are going to have any historic preservation whatsoever in this city, um, to get this ordinance that was originally written at 75%, get 75% of the people in this several block wide area, wherever it may be, to agree in writing would be impossible. You could not get 75% of people anywhere to agree in writing to something that could be the best thing on earth to get it in writing. So basically, uh, you might as well just shut down the Pre Historic Preservation Committee and say that uh, Sheboygan really doesn't care about historic preservation. As far as districts go, I believe that majority rules. Now, truthfully, I don't believe that we should have votes or you know, uh, polls to start with. But 
if we're going to, I think a simple majority of over 50% uh, should be sufficient. Uh, to get two-thirds again is definitely prohibitive to any type of historical preservation in the city. Uh, going forward with historic preservation, uh, defining historic districts and historic properties are also two different things. I believe that every homeowner, every property owner, should have the say as to whether they want their property to be to have a historic designation to be registered or not. I believe that individual property owners have that right. However, if we have this broad, need this large of a majority just to get a historic district, we will never have another historic district in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Ryan. Next we have Alderman Barn. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Whenever there's, whenever there's property involved, I get very, very afraid when government is not going to give owner uh, of a property say over what's going to happen to that property. Uh, it reminds me of eminent domain. And you know what? Recently around the country, that can of worms has opened where uh, some municipalities around the country come in and uh, want to uh, take over a, a property so that they can develop it for, for more tax base. But uh, anyway, uh, getting back to what I was saying, uh, I was glad to see this language in here that protects the property rights uh, of the owner. And I've had a couple of very thoughtful constituents call me on this matter uh, with, that, with that same sentiment that we've got to protect the rights of the individual property owner. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Vaughan. Alderman Kittleson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess I, I, I was confused as to why we needed to do this in the first place was the original uh, resolution not working that we needed to add this language. I wonder if we could, if Attorney McLean could just address what was originally in place and is it working and why we need to do this. Um, those Attorney are. McLean, do you have a response, sir? Uh, I can address what we currently have on the books uh, on these sections. Uh, if you look to, at either of the documents, but Primarily, if you look to the Substituted General Ordinance Number 660607 uh, on 15.9156 uh, sub A sub 3, it's on the second page of the ordinance. This is what's being added. No structure or site may be designated as historic structure or historic site unless the owner or owners of record have expressly agreed to such designation in writing. Uh, that is not in the current ordinance. Currently, uh, where owners file a written objection, then you can only designate the historic structure or site that's only effective upon a three-quarter vote of the entire council. Uh, so that's if somebody objects. This kind of flips it and says you have to get the owner to consent. Uh, then the, the other change having to do with the historic districts is uh, the language that uh, Alderman Susha read about uh, that the designation of the historic district won't be effective unless you have either a simple majority or, or two-thirds or three-quarters, uh, whatever percentage you want to put in there. That sentence is new. Right now, uh, there's no percentage. It's based on uh, the Historic Preservation Commission uh, makes a recommendation after having a hearing uh, of creating a district that comes to the council. The council has a hearing and votes on it. There's no requirement that there be owner input or owner consent. So what you're doing is in both of those sections, both in historic sites and structures, you're putting in a provision for owner consent and on designation of historic districts, you're doing the same thing. You're, you're providing a provision for a certain level of owner consent before you can establish the sites, structures, or districts. So that's what you're doing. Also, I would, uh, from a procedural standpoint, you've got two ordinances here. You've got the general ordinance and you've got a substitute general ordinance. Uh, I think procedurally, you want to file one and act on the other and not 
not modify them both so they both read the same. So you're, you don't want to pass two ordinances. Even if they say the same thing, it's very confusing if you've got the two documents. Thank you. Term to clean. Alderman Groff, you're next. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, a question on the amendment. Looking at the, um, the amendment was, uh, was made that instead of the 75%, it should be two-thirds. And if that's supposed to be the same as a substitute, the substitute says a simple majority. Um, so if you want to make them both the same, don't, don't they have to say either a simple majority or two-thirds, both of them? Norman Susher, your light is next. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would be willing to change the motion to reflect what Attorney McLean has just said, if that would be easier. Please, please do. For procedurally why I was going to suggest that what we need to back up and say that we need to file both ROs, file the GO, and pass the substitute. You can't have them both pass. So just file the original GO. That's exactly what I meant. There to you say. go. Is there a second to that? Second. Under discussion, if any. Thank you. Now, can I continue with amending it mm -hmm. to read um, that we would have two thirds of the affected parcels? Mm -hmm. So that would be the motion. Okay. okay. Um, I just wanted to um, answer some questions in regards. Well, uh, I worked with Attorney uh, Chuck Adams on this language, and it was him that came up with the writing of this. Um, I know that there was some discussion earlier tonight about some some uh, cases that had been presented in other states, and I know that Attorney Adams did do the research. And he's the one that came up with the language for this. And I appreciate uh, Attorney McLean for also being up to speed with what was going on. This is a, uh, I'll be right with you, Alderman Ryan. This is a tricky issue because it, it goes down to the heart of a fundamental principle regarding property rights. As Alderman Borden said, <clears throat> there's been an issue already with, with a government taking over a piece of property, not for a public use, but for a better use which uh, was, has been uh, very much discussed and legislatures have acted against it. And that's because even though they can take it for best use, they will still provide just compensation, but it, it's considered to be a taking of that property from, from the property owner. In this case, there will not be compensation, and you're going to be considerably restricting the owner's use of that property. And I'll tell you what, folks, I don't want that to happen to me. To me, that's government intrusion. If somebody's going to take my land or restrict its use to the point where it may depreciate, I'm going to have a say-so about that. So I appreciate Alderman Susha's uh, um, um, amendment and her, uh, her uh, time that she had to discuss it with Attorney Chuck Adams uh, to, to get to the bottom of the language. Alderman, Ryan. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. Um, individual property owner's rights are one thing, and that is the provision in this that says that that property owner has the right to have their property on a historic register or not. That's good. Most cities do not have that. A city can just designate that, yes, your property is a historic property, and therefore you're going to follow all these rules. A historic district is different. If you have a property in a historic district, basically if this property has any uh, architectural significance. So you know, it's a, a beautiful Victorian or a, uh, a colonial or whatever style architecture it may be. It doesn't mean that you cannot alter that property. It means that you can't tear the front off of that property and put up a glass wall instead is what it means. It doesn't mean that you can't add on to that property. What I'm saying is if we are going to have any historic districts in Sheboygan, a majority of the people that live in that district Everything else in this country, majority rules. Majority of the people elect the mayor, the majority of the people elect aldermen, the majority of the people elect our president. So why do we need two-thirds of the people to designate a historic district? It doesn't make any sense. It's too restrictive. If, it, if we pass this at two-thirds, uh, we might as well disband the Historic Preservation Committee and uh, basically say that uh, Sheboygan doesn't uh, really care about any historical buildings because that's, that's exactly what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. And we have one more. Alderman May. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, my question relates to the historic district and the commentary that Mr. Lewandowski provided in public forum. 
suggesting that if such districts are formed by uh, the owner's request, that that signature event, in essence itself, is perhaps uh, unconstitutional. I want more commentary about that. In what measure is that a real living question for us as we deal with this this uh, document? Attorney McLean. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I did have an opportunity to look at the uh, the materials that uh, Mr. Lewandowski referred to that came from uh, the State Historical Society. It's obvious to me the State Historical Society is very concerned about these issues and is concerned that uh, these owner consent provisions have a limiting effect on establishing historic sites and districts and so forth. Uh, I looked at the case law and it's, it's written from the perspective that, you know, uh, we think maybe this ought to be unconstitutional, but everything I read in there, nothing says it's unconstitutional to provide an owner consent provision. Uh, you know, I don't think the State Historical Society likes it, but there's nothing unconstitutional about it. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Uh, one more, Rehessel. Alderman Rehessel. Thank you, Your Honor. This is a very challenging issue for me as well because, as Alderman Bourne pointed out, we have property owner rights at issue here, but we also have the issue of trying to preserve some of the good things that exist here in the city of Sheboygan, some of the beautiful landmarks. So it's a real challenge in my mind, this vote. Um, but I do agree with Alderman Ryan that I think 50% is probably a more practical number to work with here. Two thirds or 75% is probably insurmountable or impossible. So I think 50% is a good number or simple majority. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on the amendment. Please re uh, repeat the amendment. Well, no need to. Does everybody know? Repeat it. it. Uh, uh, the amendment, as I understand it, would be to change in the substitute ordinance to go from a simple majority to a two-thirds. Okay, please call the roll. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Radke? No. Ryan? No. Susha? Aye. Vanderweel? No. Verhasselt? No. Boren? Aye. Serta? No. Davis? No. Graf? No. Hannah? No. Kittleson? No. Klyhunas? No. And Manny? Uh, four, four eyes and 11 no's. Motion fails. On the original motion, does anybody want to refer back that back to committee so they can discuss that issue? Alderman Ryan? Yes, Your Honor, I would like to refer it back to committee. Second. Motion second, we uh, refer back to, back to city plan and historic preservation. Would that be okay? Yes. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Two no's. Motion carries will be referred back to City Planning and Historic Preservation Committee. Alderman Gruff, your light is blinking, sir? No? No. Thank you. Okay, we have 2046 and 2047, 2048. Alderman Gruff. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I would move that the three resolutions be put upon their passage and um, specifically, therefore, establishing estimated revenue and appropriations for donations re um, to Mead Public Library establishing estimated revenue and appropriations for the Tourism Division events and establishing appropriations for municipal service building boiler contributed from the Motor Vehicle Fund and um, establishing appropriations for sick leave and vacation severance in individual cost centers. And I would move that all three of those resolutions be put upon their passage. Motion and second. Under discussion. There being none, please call the roll. Montemayor. Aye. Radke. Aye. Ryan. Susha. Vanderweel, Aye. Verhasselt, Aye. Boren, Aye. Serta, Aye. Davis, Aye. Graf, Aye. Hannah, Aye. Kittleson, Cleonis, Manny, Aye. Meyer, Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carries. 2055 General Ordinance number 680607 by Alderman Montemayor, repealing General Ordinance number 374546, which granted JJ Capsule Company the privilege of encroaching on South 9th Street for a pipe rack. Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that the general ordinance, repealing the general ordinance, be put upon its passage. The first general ordinance is not needed any longer. Is there a second to that? Second, under discussion. There being none, please call the roll. Radke, Aye. Ryan, Aye. Susha, Aye. Vanderweel, Aye. Verhasselt, Aye. Boren, Aye. Serta, Aye. Davis, Aye. Graf, Aye. Hannah, Aye. Kittleson, Cleonis, Manny, Aye. Meyer, 
and Montemayor. Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carries. Other matters authorized by law, 2185 will go to Public Works, 2186 will go to City Plan Commission, 2187 will be referred to Public Protection and Safety, 2188 will be referred to Public Works, 2189 will be referred to Public Works, 2190 will go to City Plan Commission, 2191 will go to City Plan Commission, 2192 will be referred to Public Protection and Safety, 2193 will go to Law and Licensing, Alderman Susha. Um, thank you, Your Honor. I was wondering if that could also go to Salary and Grievance, please. And to Salary and Grievance, 2193. And next item on the agenda, discussion of possible action on certain pre-closing matters related to purchase of sale agreement between the city and the county for the police station parcel and the parking lot parcel. Attorney McLean. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, as I mentioned previously on that monitoring well license agreement, uh, this is another item that came up when we did, uh, when a survey was done on the, the other piece of the, of the puzzle, the parking lot site, and I handed out uh, on all your desks at the beginning of the meeting a copy of a survey that the county surveyor's office did. Uh, it shows up in the upper right-hand corner a garage, if you see that. Uh, this was news to me. But uh, we own a third of a garage on that site uh, that's sh shared with uh, the owner of the adjacent property that owns two-thirds of the garage. There are three bays on that garage that face the alley. Uh, we had some interesting issues with that. Number one, when we first went over there and looked at the garage, we found that it was padlocked on the, the westernmost bay, which is the one uh, that's ours. And, uh, hunted around trying to figure out whose padlocks they were. It turns out that they were the owners of the adjoining property. Uh, I talked to the gentleman and suggested he remove the padlocks and remove the contents from that stall, and he did so uh, the weekend before last. Uh, so that's currently vacant. The, uh, the county had concerns when they saw that this garage was on the site. It, it's frankly not in the best condition and that's uh, being kind, I'd say. Uh, and we're concerned about what they were getting stuck with in, in uh, owning a third of a garage. Uh, as a result, we had several discussions on how to address it. Uh, one, my first salvo was to talk to the gentleman who uh, abuts there that owns the, the rental house and the two-thirds of the garage to uh, perhaps buy the garage, and we would grant him a license to maintain the third of the garage on our property until such time as the garage came down. Uh, he was interested in buying the garage, but was not interested in uh, just having a license uh, on the right to keep the third of the garage on the site. He wanted ownership of the land also, and uh, I didn't think initially that that was the right approach to take. Uh, talked with the county, and the county is willing to buy the property as is, where is, uh, as the, the original deal w was. However, I uh, was concerned about if the city building inspectors, the day after we closed, were sent over there and gave the county orders, okay, put a new roof on that garage or bring it up to code, that uh, they'd have some expense there. So what we came up with is the, att the attachment to the survey. Uh, the county has tentatively agreed to this, uh, as have tentatively the mayor and I in discussions with the county, that uh, we would agree to reimburse the county for their expenses for maintenance, repair, or removal of that garage or the portion that's on the parking lot parcel up to a cap of $1,000 within 12 months of closing. I think that's a reasonable approach. Uh, we had discussions back and forth as to the amounts and the time frames, but uh, I think the mayor and I concluded that this was a reasonable amount. Uh, our time limit's capped and the, and the dollar amount is capped. Uh, the $1,000 somewhat came out of the air, although there's some basis for it. I talked to Kim Verhelst, the purchasing agent, as far as what it would cost to demolish the garage if, say, you hired Spielvogel to do it. He indicated it 
2,000 to $2,500 to demolish the whole garage. I kind of rounded that up conservatively to 3,000 and figured a third was on the city site and it would cost $1,000. So that's roughly how the $1,000 was arrived at. Uh, I didn't, uh, we're hoping to close the transaction on Wednesday. Uh, I did not want to do that without coming to the council and getting approval for that. Uh, I would ask for your support to approve uh, that understanding with the county. Second. Second to approve the closed letter to be issued out and signed by the appropriate city officials. Any discussion? Please, do we need a roll call? Uh, spending money. Anybody want a roll call? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Other matters? Uh, 2194 is submitting various license applications for the Thank you, Your Honor. I think it would be appropriate that we do have a roll call, seeing that we are spending some money on this. So just to keep everything tidy. Would you like to have a vote taken again? Please. There's a request by the board to take the vote again. Reflect on the roll call. Is there any objection to that? Please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Susha. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Verhasselt. Aye. Boren. Aye. Zerda. Aye. Davis. Aye. Graf. Aye. Hannah. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. Clayunas, Manny, Aye. Meyer, Aye. Montmeyer, Aye. Radke. Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carries. Thank you. Other matters authorized by law. Attorney McLean. 2194, submitting various license applications for the period ending June 30, 2007 and June 30, 2008. That will be referred to law and licensing. And 2195 is a resolution authorizing the sale of lot 37 Northfield Meadows subdivision. And that will be referred to city planning. Thank you. Motion and second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We stand adjourned. Thank you very much. Have a good night.